the purpose of the state is to protect the individual and nothing more, you know, you can't have it both ways. You can't be in charge and still expect somebody to take care of you. Welcome, everyone. You have reached ReluctantPreppers.com, where we help you to be aware and prepared. Tonight, we have a very special guest, G. Edward Griffin, renowned expert on the Federal Reserve, author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, A Second Look at the Federal Reserve, and founder of FreedomForceInternational.org. Mr. G. Edward Griffin, welcome to our show. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Tonight, I'd like us to look at the question that several constitutionally minded folks have asked me about the identity of what makes America unique, how our founding fathers, the original colonists, were examples of preparedness who declared their liberty against tyranny, and then how we've changed throughout the course of our country and have lost our way in some ways as we've become more and more dependent rather than independent and forfeited our liberty in the process. So if we could just take a look together at the history of where America came from, where we're at now and where we're headed, what the trajectory is, and see what we need to do both in our public lives and closer to home to reclaim our self-reliance and independence and reclaim some of what made America worth fighting for in the first place and made America great. Good path to follow. We, we start with the, the known and head into the unknown. And there's certainly no question that we know a lot about our history because uh, we're relatively close to it. It's not like we have to go uh, and figure out what they were doing back in ancient Greece or Rome. We're fairly close to our uh, original history. And a lot of the documents uh, are still extant, easily uh, accessible. And, uh, and, and so we can really dig down to the details. And one of the things that comes to mind as I think about this uh, tableau, you know, there's so many ways to approach this topic. So each time it probably is a little bit different. But the thing that popped into my mind now is that we have a habit of saying America is great or America was great. Or sometimes we Americans say the greatest country in the world. And, uh, you know, you, you, you say those things, you hear them so often that you sometimes forget to think about what that really means. Uh, other people say that about their countries too, uh, but there's no question that even people around the world have a tendency to say that America uh, is or was one of the greatest countries in the world. And that's why we had so much immigration. People wanted to be here. <laughs> and then if they couldn't come here, they wanted to design their systems to be like us. And so they copied our constitution. A lot of them, um, unfortunately, they, they copied them uh, in terms of um, the, the phraseology, but not in terms of the ideology. And but anyway, that's getting a little bit ahead of the story here. So the point that I'm thinking about now is that, yes, America is slash was one of the greatest, if not the greatest country in the world in terms of producing a lifestyle uh, that people wanted, meaning in most cases, meaning that they were free. They weren't oppressed by a tyrannical government. They had opportunity uh, to rise up the social ladder. There were no classes here to speak of. There were some, of course, but they were not visible. They did not affect most people. Uh, we had upward mobility. You could be anything you wanted to be. And all of these things were kind of unique uh, a couple of decades ago. And yes, it was the, the greatest country in the world. But is that because Americans were different? Is it because somehow there was something in the genetic pool of Americans that made us better as human beings and therefore that's the reason? Uh, is it because uh, our, um, uh, our natural resources were better? Is it because our climate was better? Was our food better? Was our educational system better? What was it? What caused that? And that's the point that I think really needs the closer attention. Obviously, it's not the genetic pool because Americans came from all over the world. Uh, we have, uh, you know, we have 
uh, Europeans, Africans, Asians. We've got uh, all nationalities, uh, all cultures came over here, came over here. And initially, at least, uh, the idea was that they they didn't want to retain their cultures or their nationalities. They respected them. They didn't despise them, but they didn't want to retain them. They were willing to uh, jump into the melting pot, as we called it. Well, even and, before that, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, people who desired to come to this new land, if you if we really start at the beginning, as you mentioned, there were folks who were leaving uh, tyrannical and oppressive societies and yearning for freedom, both in a sense political, economic, and religious freedom. And those can't have been ordinary average folks in the sense of the being willing to leave everything behind, a family and fortune and, and country and everything that was familiar and voyage out across the unknown and, and go to a completely foreign land across the ocean by means of travel that must have been considered, you know, uh, unfamiliar and dangerous and, and to, it had to be hardy and intrepid and, and in a sense rugged people to willing to take that, that journey and uh, to, to reach and strive for that liberty and, and really um, take a great sense of ownership and accountability for their own, their own destiny. Yeah, that is true. Uh, there's no question about it that they were brave and, and they were motivated. They weren't just your average, uh, what we would call six-pack Joe today. Uh, th these people uh, had uh, great conviction and were willing to risk all for something they believed in. So, yes, you've got a good point there that maybe there was sort of a genetic uh, selection there in the very beginning when the hazards were so great. But, you know, the majority of the migration later uh, didn't involve so much of that hazard. It was just a question of borrowing some money or saving up some money and getting a passage on a boat. And that's where most of the immigration came. And, uh, and, and even so, uh, America became uh, the greatest country in the world based upon a much larger genetic influx from that period than from the earlier days of the pilgrims and that sort of thing. And at least that's my bias in thinking about this, that it's not genetic. Uh, I, I just don't think it's that, yeah. I wasn't trying to imply that it was. What I guess I meant was that there was this ethos or this this common spirit of um, a great sense of determination, of self-determination, and a great yes. sense of, of uh, ownership and of, in a sense, people pulling themselves up by their bootstraps and saying, I'm going to make a life for myself, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, the, in the formation of the country, you mentioned ideology, they're, they're basing the... Uh, the structure of their society and then of the government to, pr to protect the liberties of that society on uh, God-given rights uh, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and, and in a sense putting government in its place by saying it was instituted by the people and to serve the people's liberty and that they retained the right to alter or abolish it. In other words, it was uh, a servant of their liberty and a servant of the people and just that's where I was imagining us starting just to talk about uh, that if that's the constitution that we started from then um, what direction did we head from there how did that change in in ways through the next century or two to end up in the uh, recently in the 20th century with many different changes that occurred in terms of the relationship between people and, and the states. Yeah, well, you've, you've hit the nail right on the head there. Even getting back to my original departure point, which was the question of what was it that made America great? If it's not the genetic pool, it wasn't the religion uh, specifically, you know, what was it? And I, so let's jump to that. In, in my view, at least, it was, um, it was a, a culmination of some very fortuitous circumstances. It was... Uh, Time. It was time for certain things to happen. Uh, the philosophical writers in Europe, you know, were, were beginning to to dabble with with concepts of personal liberty and freedom. Uh, you know, the uh, the rise of nations. The, the founding fathers here in America were scholars. Let's face it; these were not your average farmers. The guys that went to the Philadelphia Convention and drafted the uh, the Constitution. Uh, were well-educated people. They would put most of us today to shame. And, uh, and they most of them had traveled to, to Europe. They'd studied in Europe. They came from wealthy families. They were, what, that dreaded word, they were part of the elite of the period. 
And they, it, it happened at a time in history when um, people like Adam Smith were writing about concepts of personal property and uh, the free market and, uh, and the idea that the human being individually was sovereign and that the, the kings were not the source of sovereignty, but that the individual was the source of sovereignty. And this was a new idea. It had never really been contemplated uh, in history, it's certainly not written by the philosophers, the political theorists, nobody. It was just a new idea that happened at that particular point in time. And then the other uh, fortuitous circumstance was that here in the American colonies, I say here, <laughs> in those days they were the colonies, here we had this this uh, ruling uh, group of people, um, the, the smaller group of people who were the dominant ones in society, who had enough affluence that they were able to spend time, they could send their young men and to some extent, their young women to school, and they would they could learn philosophy and read about history. They knew about ancient Rome. They knew more about history than the average American college graduate knows today. And they began to think. And these are the people who rose up and became leaders of the American Revolution. And of course, we can skip over that dramatic piece of history. We all know about what you know what the odds were of winning that war against Great Britain. It was pretty small, but they won nevertheless. And now here they had this opportunity to create a new system from the ground up. Now, every time that happened before, the winners always just replicated the system they previously had, and this declared that now they were the new rulers. They were the new emperors or kings or whatever they were called. Um, sometimes they were religious sects that ruled, and they became theocracies. Uh, and, but most of the time, they were monarchies. And so when the colonists overthrew the uh, or defeated the British army and now had a chance to create their own system. Uh, it was amazing. It was a fluke of history that they decided to do something different. It had never been done before. They decided to create a constitutional republic instead of a monarchy. Everybody wanted George Washington to be the new king. Uh, most of the people in America thought there was nothing wrong with uh, having a king. They just didn't like the old one. They wanted a new one. They wanted one that was an American king. That was what they were used to. Nothing wrong with that. And But if it hadn't been for this small group like you know Washington and Jefferson and Adams and those fellows, well, we would have had an, another monarchy here in the United States. But they said, no, let's try this thing called a constitutional republic in which – the sovereign uh, element of society is the person himself, the individual, and that the state is designed to serve the individual instead of the individual supposedly serving the state. That's the first time that had ever happened. And so now we finally get back to the question at the beginning, what made America great? I think that was it. It was uh, not its people. It was not its resources, not the genetic pool, not the weather, not the climate or any of that sort of thing. It was the genius of those people at the Constitutional Convention who tried an experiment. They called it the experiment then, and it certainly was. They created a constitutional republic which limited the power of the state and made the state subservient to the people. Now, Having said that, and that's something we all know, we've read about it, maybe we haven't thought too much about what it means, now we compare that with what we have today. Well, gradually, bit by bit, the system has been turned around and put back to the way it was before the American Revolution, where now we as individuals serve the state, and the state does not serve us. We now have a king. We don't call him a king, we call him a president, but we now essentially have an emperor or a king, a monarch, and people in America seem to think that's okay because they don't understand uh, the ideological questions that were very much in the minds of those who drafted the American Constitution. Before we leave the uh, colonialists and turn entirely to the more recent centuries, I just you what you were describing about um, the genius of that era and the experiment that they launched on, I also wanted to ask you what we know about 
the self-reliance of the individuals of that time. In other words, if they didn't expect the state to take care of them, were they uh, constituted themselves to be self-reliant? Was that in the, the makeup of their, their expectation of themselves and on each other and in their communities that they would take care of themselves? Well, yes, I think the question is self-answering when you think of it, because if we understand that the state was created by the individuals and the state had its purpose to protect the lives, liberty, and property of the individuals, nothing more. It was the servant of the individuals. You might actually ask your servant to protect you, but you don't ask your servant to feed you and teach you and educate you and tell you what to think and what to wear and, you know, make all of your daily decisions. Your servant is your servant and you're in charge. You sort of have to take care of your servant. You, you've got to pay your servants. You've got to be concerned about your servant's well-being because it's in your own self-interest to do so and so forth. But obviously, when you accept the idea that the purpose of the state is to protect the individual and nothing more, which was what it was all about, obviously you don't turn to the state and say, well, take care of me and provide my medical care benefits and, you know, take care of my housing and my food and my education and, you know, tell me where to work and train me for this, that, and the thing. And not at all. In the beginning, the individual was self-reliant and that's part of the deal. You know, you can't have it both ways. You can't be in charge and still expect somebody to take care of you. So how long did that last, that tradition of self-reliance? That's a good question. I don't think there's any way to to put a mark on it. Uh, and there was a time not too long ago when I would have said, well, it lasted maybe for 100 years. But now as I've gone back and reread some of those uh, older documents, I realize that the attack on self-reliance and individualism started almost immediately in the very first administration under, the, under Washington administration. There were signs of a building of a bureaucracy beginning to uh, see that uh, this thing called government was a pretty good way to exploit one's neighbor. <laughs> and there were signs of it right from the very beginning. So I don't know. I, I think in general, though, we, we could say that the first hundred years of America's existence, it was pretty well agreed across the board that in general, we had to be, we were in fact self-reliant, even though even even then uh, people were beginning to uh, turn to the state and think that the state should provide a little bit of benefit here, a little bit of benefit there. But uh, so just to put a mark on it, I would say a hundred years ago, certainly by the time of the Wilson administration, uh, things were definitely beginning to change at that point. And if, if I had to put a mark on it, I would say it was uh, during the Wilson administration that the United States was converted from a constitutional republic into a democratic dictatorship. So just wondering how it is that such a fiercely self-reliant people would voluntarily surrender so much of their own liberty and independence during that first half of the 20th century. Is that what happened? Well, I think that the, uh, the honest answer is that they did not uh, voluntarily surrender any of it. They were tricked into it. They didn't realize that they were surrendering their self-reliance. Uh, they were fooled by demagogues, political demagogues, and, uh, and some of them in academia too. Uh, they were fooled into thinking th that... Um, security was more important than independence and freedom. And they weren't expected to think about what they were giving up. They were only expected to think about what they were gaining. So I think they were tricked. Uh, I can relate to that a little bit. I went through school. Um, I certainly wasn't born with any of this information. And my first uh, uh, 20 years of life was uh, pretty much in uh, the state of, um, you know, absorbing information and not questioning it. Young people don't often question too deeply, especially these deeper philosophical or ideological issues. And I went through school being taught that, you know, the democracy was a wonderful thing and the greatest good for the greater number was okay and the individual had to be sacrificed. That sounded good. I thought, uh, you know, all of the... Uh, uh, the slogans of Marxism uh, sounded good to me. Uh, 
uh, from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. You know, what's wrong with that? Doesn't that sort of sound good? And so I, I came through the first 20 years of my life and just sort of buying into all of this because I was only being exposed to half of the equation. I was only being exposed to the, to the, uh, uh, to the bait, and I was never allowed to see the spring in the trap that was behind the bait. And so I think the answer to the question is that the American people were victimized by their political leaders and their educational system. You make the analogy of a mouse trap. It makes me think about not just the bait and the spring, but the why. There must be a, a master reason why. There must be a plan of why is this trap being set. And the, the two that first come to mind in this case is thinking either that someone is genuinely believes the ideology that you were describing is is that the way to help the most people is to do exactly as you said. You take from those who can produce and, and give to those who seem to be struggling with that. Isn't there additionally a motivation that uh, you mentioned earlier? I mean, the people who are doing the educating of people to think that way um, were gaining from it some are more equal than others. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There, there, some are far more weak, equal than others. Well, I think the answer is that most of the people um, who buy into the collectivist ideology, which is what we're talking about here, uh, do so out of sincerity. They have, you know, their motives are good. Uh, they want to do what is right for their neighbor and for their family and their friends, their country, the world. Uh, you know, that was certainly my motive. I, I thought, gee, I, naturally, I, I want to do good, too. I want to put my own interests very high on the list, but I didn't want to hurt anybody. I didn't want to take advantage of anybody. Uh, you know, I believe in the golden rule and all that sort of thing. So I think most the of the collectivists come into it at that level. But, you know, I've reluctantly come to conclude that within any cross-section of the population – you're going to find a certain percentage of people that I would call um, uh, predators. They have a predator instinct that is uh, much higher than the average person. And I, I've come to the feeling that there's about 15% of the population that have a very strong predator instinct. And they they're the ones who would be far more willing to – to steal, to cheat, to rob, to enslave, to be brutal. And that's just part of their genetic nature, I think. I know we get into the argument, is this inculcated by culture or is it uh, genetic? I think it's primarily genetic. That's my view anyway. But regardless of this cause, I think there's about 15% of the population that would just gravitate into any opportunity if they were given that opportunity to exploit their fellow man. Well, once you have the concept that the state is a, is a government, in other words, it has the authority to compel everybody to do something and you can redistribute wealth. You can take money from some people and give it to others and you can be considered as a great guy for doing so because you're serving some kind of a higher principle of taking care of the masses. Once you've got that power, that lever of power in your hands, you're going to be tempted, especially if you've got this predator instinct, you're going to be tempted to start to use that power for something other than the best interests of mankind. You're going to use it for your own benefit. And so I think whenever you have, well, I not think, I know, I can look into history as anyone can and see wherever, whenever government has been given a lot of power, that is a direct measure of the extent to which that government has been taken over by predators from society. The crooks in society, the criminals in society move into government and that those are the people who are wind up running this thing. And so we wind up eventually, even though I don't care how high the ideals were in the beginning, eventually that institution winds up uh, as uh, nothing more or less than an uh, a crime syndicate. And th that's what happens when you let the state move beyond that defensive um, uh, purpose, the purpose of defending life, liberty, and property of its citizens, which is the proper role of the state. Once you step over that line 
and let the state start to redistribute wealth and direct the activities of its citizens, now you've created a magnet for the predator class. And that really, in my view, is the basic understanding of why all governments that go beyond the defensive role, all governments devolve into a, a criminal state. Well, we've certainly seen in modern society this tremendous increase in the uh, nanny state and some say socialism, where large percentages of the American people receiving food stamps, being on other entitlement programs, and uh, expecting the government to provide for them, whether it's health care, whether it's uh, all types of different benefits. So that gets back to the bait that you talked about in the past. And then if the proper role of government is to protect, it seems that that gets twisted or distorted in, in saying, well, it's for your own protection that we have to increase these measures that are taking away your liberties. Is that, I mean, what other, those seem to be the, the two, the carrot and the stick in terms of it's either so that we can provide you with these goodies, these benefits, or it's so that we can protect you from these bad consequences either way. Yeah, well, that's, that is the trick. That's the difference between the, the bait and the spring. They always talk about the benefits. But even using the phrase the nanny state is kind of deceptive because that implies that the purpose of the state is to be your nanny, which is to take care of you. Well, but and that may start out to be the case, but give that state a couple of decades of existence and it's no longer the nanny. It's the policeman. It's the executioner. It's the uh, jailer. It's not the nanny anymore. So that leads us into the more recent decades where we've seen so many what would have been considered unthinkable levels of intrusion into people's lives through almost constant surveillance of innocent citizens. We've certainly had high-profile scandals recently of uh, NSA spying and talk of drones being purchased at large numbers by the country. I know uh, Senator Rand Paul has been objecting to uh, some of that spying. Video cameras in more and more public places. I just saw an article the other day about the police department in San Jose, California, making a program where they get citizens to cooperate with them to allow the police to tap into the private home security cameras of the, the, the residents there uh, who participate in that program so that they can increase their surveillance coverage. And an uh, article also on SWAT raids increasing. I remember when I was a kid, we thought it was the coolest thing. Everybody had wanted to have a SWAT lunchbox because that TV show had just started with the, the new techniques and so on that the uh, police could have, and it seemed so exciting and dramatic. Uh, but in terms of SWAT raids starting out from just a few hundred in the first year that that program was launched and now over 50,000 SWAT raids a year throughout the country. Well, the perfect example, everything you've mentioned is the bait, isn't it? I mean, we we thought that SWAT teams were magnificent because the the assumption was that they were going to be used to to run down killers and murderers and rapists. I mean, really bad guys, terrorists. Well, the whole idea, right, of the militarized force was necessary to be able yeah. to handle things that against those very most violent uh, situations yeah. where traditional it, methods wouldn't. Yeah, of course. And so now that was the bait. Now after that's instituted and we bought into it, now we see the spring, which is they're using SWAT teams to raid people who are selling organic milk. To their customers, you know, because <laughs> so it's gone far beyond the bad guy. Uh, yeah, we're in a state right now where we all, under some conditions, can be considered to be uh, criminals in the eyes of the state. It, there are so many laws on the books. Uh, we don't know how many there are even or what they are. I think there's nobody alive in America today that goes through a whole day without breaking a law of some kind, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> Uh, even if he stays in bed all day, there's probably a law against that somewhere. Well, and back to where we started on the formation of the our, our nation based on this constitutional republic, there's been significant concern expressed in, in major stories in the last year about restrictions or, or overriding, overruling of constitutional rights. The First Amendment, the, the freedom of speech, and we have the Department of Justice uh, doing this investigation of media. has been a chilling effect on who the sources are that can talk to media people. They're afraid they're being uh, going to be prosecuted or going to be uh, investigated. Second Amendment, the, about the citizenry's right to keep and bear arms, has been under huge attack and scrutiny over the last couple of years, where every every type of um, crisis that, that appears seems to be uh, an opportunity for clamping down on 
on that, and that does reach back to what you had talked about in the beginning of the state supposed to be a servant of the master being the people and not the other way around. And then the the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable search and seizure uh, gets right back into this uh, surveillance and intrusion and and uh, whether our emails, our phone calls, and everything else are are private anymore, whether we have any privacy at all left. So it certainly seems that our constitutional uh, rights are under attack, and that fits exactly with what you were saying about about a state becoming the police. Well, I think that's that's the crux of it, and I understand that most Americans, as I was at one time not too long ago, most Americans are in denial. I remember uh, thinking that all the things I had read about our Constitution and about the founding of our great republic uh, were still true. I thought that our government still was responsive to the will of the people and that it was there to serve us. Heck, I came out of college thinking that. Uh, I went, I saw uh, World War II. I was still a young boy then, but I saw World War II. And boy, when we won that war, we thought we had made the world safe for democracy. I had no idea what that word meant. Um, what, what I didn't realize is that democracy was not uh, the best form of government at all, that it always evolves into mob rule and it makes it possible for demagogues to manipulate the masses and deny the rights of minorities and all these. I didn't understand that. All I knew were these slogans that were thrown at me and I was in denial. It wasn't until many years later that I realized that, golly, uh, we had lost our moorings uh, long before World War II. We lost them in World War I. And I didn't know any of that because that wasn't what they taught in school. So, you know, we're in that trap right now where where do you, where do you find out these things? Um, fortunately, as I said in the very beginning, our history is still fairly close to us. And there are documents that are still in existence. You can go to a library today. Fortunately, we still have libraries with books made of paper. And they're on the shelves, and you can still go and see these things that maybe are 100 years old or 150 years old. Uh, they're trying to get rid of those things because uh, they are there. They can't be changed. They can be burned, but they can't be changed. Whereas now the trend, of course, is to get all of this information digitized and onto the internet or into some kind of data storage. And as we all know, you, you can change history with keystroke on your computer. You can change a date or a name. You can change an event. You can, you can rewrite history and it'll, it'll rewrite in all the data sources in the world in a matter of a second or two. And that is really spooky because once that is done and all of the hard records are buried or destroyed, then there's no way to go back and find out what really happened in history. We've become the Wikipedia uh, era, I guess, and uh, as we all know, Wikipedia is constantly being revised every day. People go online there and change what's on Wikipedia, and we don't even know who they are that are rewriting that. I had a little run-in with that myself because although I have never put myself up on Wikipedia, somebody else did, and then somebody else came along and took the information down. <laughs> there was a battle going on about my own personal history up there, and I had nothing to do with it, but it depended on uh, who my friends were and who people were that didn't like what I was saying. They were actually writing my history. My People who didn't like me were writing my history on Wikipedia. So there you have it. I saw that with my own eyes. It's still up there, by the way. Anyway, just a little microcosm of uh, what's coming in the future if, if we allow it to continue. So with all of that, what can an individual who wants to reclaim uh, some of their own uh, self-reliance, some of their own individual liberty, some of their rightful integrity of what it means to be an American, what are a few steps that an individual can take that will make a difference first in their own life and then for the greater good? I'm glad you brought that up. Um, in this discussion, let's just assume for the sake of brevity that um, an individual, this individual we're talking about, understands the ideological issues that we have been discussing. They understand the difference between individualism and collectivism. They understand that the individual is the, is the basis of society, not the group. 
You know, they understand that rights are intrinsic and not granted by the state. Uh, they understand these things. Let's just go over that. If they don't understand them, then there's nothing they can do to uh, to preserve their rights because they don't understand the origin of their rights or what their rights depend upon. So, but let's skip over that because uh, at Freedom Force International, which is the organization you mentioned earlier that I founded, and thank you for that, by the way, we spent a lot of time talking about those issues of the difference between individualism and collectivism. And if there's anybody with an earshot of this discussion that would like to at least find out what we think they are, want to brush up on that, I invite you to come to freedomforceinternational.org and spend some time there because it's critically important that we know what we stand for, what our principles are, uh, before we determine how we're going to preserve them, you know, because if we don't understand that we may advocate something that is re really not in our best interest that may actually undermine the very principles which we cherish. Um, so anyway, having said that, now we turn to the all-important question of what do we do about it? How do we preserve these uh, these liberties and these principles? Uh, and, and how do we build upon them and make a better world in the future instead of a, a worse world where we seem to be headed? And the answer to that to me is so clear. And that is that we have to become more than philosophers and talkers. We have to become doers. We have to get up off of our couches and away from our, our uh, computers, uh, get off of Facebook and go out into the world where people are and participate in the organizations that people belong to, especially the organizations that have political influence. I'm talking about political parties. I'm talking about labor unions, or at least the organization and leadership of labor unions, media centers, uh, church organizations. Um, people have a herd instinct, and we, we move in groups. We follow leaders, and the leaders of the major groups in any society are the ones who determine how that society is going to go philosophically and politically. And so if we want to make a difference – and we want to help shape the future, we have to be active and we have to be influential within those power centers, those organizations that lead the nation. In other words, we have to get out there and get, get active in politics primarily and also in education and other fields where we have influence over other people. We have to play the role of leadership as best we can. And if we don't have, if we don't think we have that talent or that aptitude to be a leader, well, we better find somebody who does that thinks right and give them our total support, give them everything we can as though we ourselves were trying to do what they're trying to do. We have to do that. Now, having said that, it's not so hard to do. When you think about the people who have taken over the world, literally, not just in America, but every country in the world. How have they done it? Have they done it through bayonets? Well, they haven't done it through bombs and bayonets in the major countries, although that's still, you know, they never give up on that. But when it came to taking over the United States, for example, or Great Britain or France or Germany, they didn't take, they took them over through these power centers that I'm talking about, the political parties, those structures. They took over the newspapers, the television stations, just a few people at the top. And it wasn't done through a military invasion. That is the clue. That is how we reverse this process. We have to go into these power centers and offer our, ourselves as potential leaders. We have to gain influence in them. And in that fashion, we can lead the nation back toward the constitutional republic that has been destroyed on our watch. And on the, in, on the home front, in addition to the public-facing mission that you described there, what do you see as actions that an individual can take closer to home, within the walls of their own home, for their family, for themselves as an individual? You mentioned educate yourself, understand what your uh, natural rights and liberties are, understand the difference between individualism and collectivism. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of G.K. Chesterton, but he advocates distributism where oh, yes. people own the oh, means yes. of their own yeah. production, the source of wealth. Yeah. Could you maybe say a few words about um, what someone can, in addition to self-education and public involvement, is there anything that they can do in their home life? Well, yeah, I suppose uh, you, know, you, have to, you have to live what you talk about. 
you, you can't, uh, you know, you can't advocate indep- independence and then go around being dependent and promoting every uh, government program that comes along and for participating in it. Um, so I, I think you have to be, you know, you have to be a good example in your life, especially if you're a parent. Um, I would, I would say that, uh, the answer to that question depends a lot on who you are and where you are, what your situation is, what resources you have, but that we all can do things, uh, but just looking inward, like to yourself and to your family, I think you, uh, it doesn't take much reflection. You, you have to become able. You have to be valuable to somebody. You have to produce something. You have to have a service or a talent, be able to help somebody do something that may be necessary in times of crisis. In other words, um, being a poet is not necessarily uh, the best thing, the best talent you can have uh, it, if everybody is going hungry, you see, uh, uh, being a poet is a wonderful thing in a, in a great uh, affluent society where everything is working fine. But if, the, if there's uh, uh, civil um, unrest, if, if there's not enough food or water going around, uh, if people are really quite hungry on the verge of starving and they're in the, in the mode of bartering for food and shelter and, and clothing and so forth. And this is a terrible image to be bringing up, but we may be facing that sort of thing. I, I don't know that you can, you can offer your um, services as a poet or a public speaker or even a writer such as myself. Uh, I think I can offer some books. They said, no, I can't eat the book. What else can you do? I say, well, let's see. Uh, uh, I can fix carburetors. <laughs> oh, well, now that's something else. <laughs> In a sense, it's almost reclaiming our ability to be self-reliant because in a sense, it sounds like that's part of not needing to go into the trap and take the bait and get hit by the spring. Uh Uh Because in addition to saying, I'm going to participate in uh, making a more ethical political structure by supporting either myself as a leader or or others who I believe are wanting government to be a servant of the people and not the other way around, uh, we also need to say... I need to not need the government to take care of me. So that's where I was seeing that making perfect sense. I think we all need to focus on having very practical skills, um, maybe medical skills, cooking skills, growing food, uh, uh, building things, repairing things, things like that that we don't often think about if we're in a, you know, a highly tiered society where our skills are, are so divided into minuscule components Uh, They may not be very useful if and when things fall apart. So let me just try to summarize everything we've covered in this great story, this great transition from where our first colonialists coming here, the first Americans uh, escaping tyranny in England and then declaring their independence here, fiercely self-reliant, able to take care of themselves, meet the basic needs of their families and their communities, and uh, that being a necessary underpinning for their freedom. And... Then, over the next two centuries, the increase from government expanding itself and people taking the the handouts from government and surrendering bit by bit their personal independence and becoming more and more dependent upon the government to where they lost their way and forgot who we are as Americans, that to really be an authentic American is to possess liberty, and that liberty coming from independence, and that independence being based on self-reliance, preparedness, and the ability to take care of ourselves. And that in order to reclaim our liberty, we first need to reclaim our ability to be prepared, to be self-reliant, to take care of our families first and our communities. And instead of asking the government to be our nanny, which turns into a police state, instead say that our government needs to be the servant of the people and serve to protect our liberties. And that's what made America great in the first place. That's what it is to be an American. Yes, and I'd like to close by, uh, on a more positive note, by saying that uh, the real, the real positive side of this picture is that uh, because things are unraveling and they're, they're really coming apart at the seams, uh, as bad as that may seem, and as bad as it is, it gives us an opportunity 
to make some significant changes. We'll now have an opportunity to, to rebuild. We'll have an opportunity to make some significant improvements. The Constitution, which was given to us, was an amazing uh, beta model, absolutely amazing for a beta model. It wasn't perfect, obviously, because it didn't hold up for more than about 100 years. But the fact that it did for 100 years is pretty good, I think. Now we have a chance because of this, of this recent history to see how the predators that I was talking about were able to exploit some weaknesses in the Constitution. And so the next time around, we have a chance to redo it and make it better. The next model will last much longer than 100 years. Maybe it'll last 1,000 years. And that one, too, will fall apart eventually. But then those who lived through that one will say, aha, we see wh what the problems were. And the next one will last 10,000 years and so forth. That's, that's the bright side of picture. We're building upon human experience. And so our opportunity right now is really magnificent because we can become the leaders in the next round the next, the next founding fathers, you might say. We have a chance to build a new society, and for that, I am very, I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to participate in that undertaking. And if anybody wants to, you know, who shares that enthusiasm for this, I urge you to do a couple of things. One is, first of all, uh, I, I offer you a free subscription to my weekly news service, which is called Unfiltered News. I spend a lot of time with that every week trying to pull together the important news stories uh, from around the world and, and explain up front in a headline or two uh, just what it's all about. It's called Unfiltered News. You can look it up on the internet, unfilterednews.com. It's free, and I urge you to, to uh, sign on and, and see what kind of mischief we get into. Secondly, if you want to become part of the solution, definitely go to freedomforceinternational.org. See what we have to say there, and I urge you to become part of the Freedom Team because we can make a difference for the future. Well, G. Edward Griffin, on behalf of all the freedom-minded individuals who uh, will be listening to this, I appreciate you spending the time with us. Thank you so much, and we look forward to being able to talk with you again. Oh, yes, I definitely would. Thank you. Thank you.